Now this is a different sort of video to the ones that I've done recently. A friend put it to me, and I'm both paraphrasing and filling in some gaps here, that one of the features of our age is that people are feeling very lost. And it's an observation that obviously rings true. There's lots of change in the world, some of it complex and hard to understand, and people don't know what to think, don't know what to believe, particularly don't know what to do. That friend also put it to me that it would be good if I could talk about this more from my perspective rather than my usual videos where I research a specific topic. Well, challenge accepted. Let's see where it goes. Let me start by telling you about a phenomenon that I have seen often with my own eyes when people who, on paper and in the eyes of the world, have it all but end up feeling lost anyway. Some of you will know that I used to work for an organisation called Business in a Community, and the short version is that it brought together the top businesses in the country, and particularly that meant the top business leaders, the chief executives and similar in the country, and tried to get them to give a damn about what was happening in their community and to want to do something about it with all the resources their business might bring to bear. Now, why would they want to do that, you might ask? Well, it varied. For some, it was about tapping into a desirable network, because once some of the top guys were involved, then quite a lot of the others would want to also get involved to get access to them. The organisation played quite deliberately on that, by the way. The executives involved on the leadership teams were never, ever allowed to delegate downwards, because if you allowed that, it would quickly degrade, and then fewer and fewer of those top guys would ever turn up. For others, it was because they wanted their businesses to navigate the social and environmental risks better, so they needed to know more about them. They wanted to get their defence in early, if you like. For others, it was because the Prince of Wales was president and they kind of had an eye on some sort of honour once they put in the requisite amount of effort. Now, you can be cynical about such things, and I certainly am, having seen it in action, but don't underestimate it. The British Empire used to run on motivating local elites to become aspirational about medals and honours and titles and stuff. You had to be part of a system to understand it. And I could name names about executives for whom it was at least one of their key motivations. But there was something else, and this was something that I saw a lot. It might even have been the most common factor. And it was when people had been following their success path. You know, they'd laid out how they were going to get to the top job, how they were going to get to make a shed load of money and whatever else it was that was on their bucket list. And they'd got there. They'd done it. They'd navigated the path, which was no doubt less straight and less easy than they'd hoped. And that made it all the more special. Triumph, success, at the top of their game. And now they were feeling lost, empty. Asking themselves, is that it? Shouldn't it feel, you know, great? Why do I feel like something important is missing? And that's because it was. And those people had turned to business in the community because they had realised that what was missing, for them at least, was something to do with values. Making a more meaningful contribution to the society around you. One of the common things through the, well, the history of business, for one thing, is that very wealthy, successful business people often value the process of, quote, giving something back. Now, that's not entirely the process I'm describing here. That's more the fact that all successful people are inveterate networkers and builders of institutions. They understand that you have to help the next generation to rise up because people helped them to rise up in turn. And it's how the system works. You have to put in to get out. How systems work is all part of the point, and I'll come back to it. But no... The process I'm really describing in the case of these executives in business in the community, it's more about personal purpose. What are they for? What are you for? 
Those executives have defined themselves in relation to personal success based on measures like money, recognition, position, and after the event, they'd realised that really such success was best understood as a means to an end. If you didn't have the purpose, then when you got there, it was a valid question. Well, that was a lot of work, hard work, pain. So, yay, you've got a yacht now. So what? And that so what is the question that many of us are grappling with. Because you could use those executives' dilemma as an analogy for our wider society. Our traditional societies didn't have a lot of sense of momentum because for hundreds of years they saw progress at a crawling speed with frequent setbacks such as famines, floods, disease and war. You went forward, you came backwards, it came in waves. They didn't see themselves as being on a straight line journey. At best it was an ongoing healthy ecosystem with social norms to help keep it that way. Now we would look back on that status quo today and we'd probably find it harshly restrictive. But the clarity of what was expected and what your place in that society might be, that probably had a great deal of comfort as well. In any case, it was what it was. Then we hit the Industrial Revolution. The growth of wealth, the transformation of society by innovation, that profoundly changed our view of ourselves, I think. Suddenly we began to see our societies as being on that straight line journey. Like those executives, we became aspirational for the wealth we would create in the future, the things we would invent, what it would enable us to do, and we started to get this sense of progress. Progress towards what, you might ask. What is that end goal that you set out if you're making progress? De facto, the answer always comes in the form of wealth. And that translates into all the things we need for a comfortable life and security and stuff. And how we define that keeps moving. One reason why we now define poverty in ways that are substantially different from what it used to be. You know, starving without food. But look, by any rational measure, the Western world particularly reached the end of that journey. We now have incredible wealth. Technology previous generations just couldn't have dreamed of. Now, of course, many people like to paint that we're in a borderline dystopia compared to where they think we should be. But to the people of 1800, this is the utopia. I mean, sure, it's imperfect in all sorts of ways, but really only because you stopped appreciating the miracle of what you've got. You will not starve tomorrow. You can read any book, travel to any place, listen to any music, learn any skill, have a constant window on the wider world. And the question is, so what? What do you want to do with all of that now that you've arrived at this end destination? Because that's it. Yes, destination reached. Sure, technology will continue to improve, but none of it will make your quality of life significantly materially different. So it's time to answer that question. And of course, the answer is that we don't know at the moment. We feel like we've outgrown the system where we know our place or we can make our place because we know how the system works. And the goal is simply to do well and to feed into the system. We've been seduced into thinking that we personally, we're kind of too important for that sort of a role. We'd imagine that the straight path of progress was a never-ending journey where we simply get better and better and better. For the young adults of today should expect to be wealthier than their parents, who in turn were wealthier than their parents. And they are scandalised if it looks like that might not be the case. Inclined to blame those that came before, because they've obviously failed in their duty somehow. And that's largely their parents' own fault, of course, because they were the ones who taught those kids to have those expectations because it's what they believe themselves. It's what we've all talked ourselves into believing. Here's the truth that we get from nature. Everything has a season. It comes in waves. Things move forward. Things move back. Just because the sun's shining today, you don't plan your life in the expectation that one day it won't be raining. One day it won't be freezing cold and snowing. So what are you going to do about it? Business executives hire life coaches to help them sort out what they should do next if they reach this sort of quandary. But our societies and the people who inhabit them do not get to be coached through their existential crises. As a result, 
People end up winging it. Some of them decide that it's the end of everything and end up flocking to causes based on that premise. Whether it's Extinction Rebellion or some religious end of a world scenario or whatever it might be. Some are very susceptible to those who feed on the alienation and present you with answers. I always remember that bit of The Matrix, which was one reason why it appealed so much to a certain kind of person. When Morpheus was telling Neo that this was why you're here, you know something's wrong. You felt it your whole life, like a splinter in your mind. Now, lots of people would have been watching that and thinking, hey, that's how I feel. But of course, something wrong is a handily broad concept that we can all paint our perceptions onto. Indeed, it's a standard technique. If you can tap into something that is widespread in the way that people feel, but they think is personal to them, and all of us have the same doubts and there's disconnections, then you can make them feel that you're talking uniquely to them. You understand them. Stage illusionists do it. Fortune tellers do it. I was even given an example of how pickup artists use it to seduce beautiful women. Ah, people tell you how beautiful you are, but secretly, sometimes I know that you don't feel as confident as they think you are. Ah, yes, a genius insight. How did you know that sometimes I secretly feel like that? Because it's true of everyone. That's how. The point is... People will gravitate to those who seem to offer solutions to that sense of their alienation. In a political sense, we're seeing this with the rise of populism and populist leaders. Now, Ray Dalio would tell you, and this rings true to me, that populists rise when societies have become decadent, the obvious disparities in wealth have become too great... And that happens side by side with the growth of debt in your society, meaning that it becomes more and more difficult, even impossible, for people to see the same aspirational path for themselves. So they look at others and they just get resentful. Resentful at the corrupt elites. And that feeds the rise of populists offering some form of revolution. Now, I think that's right. But I also think there's some disconnection from the traditional values that got us here. Those older values had a lot more clarity and certainty versus what can seem like individualistic, self-serving values of those that we see in charge of the various institutions. So people like Marine Le Pen, like Putin, like Trump, like Viktor Orban, maybe also Boris Johnson, if only by accident during the Brexit period, they offer by implication a reconnection with those traditional values. If you look too closely, you'll probably find it's a caricature of those values, a sort of self-serving distillation into a few flashpoints. But it's powerful nonetheless. A return to the things that offered certainty is really powerful when you're feeling lost and uncertain. And the danger is that they attract trust and support from a wide number of people when the mainstream political parties and leaders have stopped offering defence of those values, which increasingly they have. Otherwise, wokeness could never have taken any kind of hold. If you abandon that sort of sense for the mainstream, then you are going to end up with power going to the fringe. Now, there are people now in our supposed enlightened Western society offering excuses for Vladimir Putin. They found common cause with him as a leader because he, like them, was anti-woke. And that made them ready to buy from him the idea of a world that's still based on the might-makes-right version of history. It's a powerful thing because it's based on values, a sense of self-identity, not an expediency. And it's why the Brexit vote went the way that it did, because they talked about the economic impact of leaving the EU. The Brexiteers talked about the Britishness and being in control of your own destiny. And it's the same thing that led Ukrainians to fight so fiercely in recent weeks. A sense of nationhood based on common values, something that's worth defending unto death. Modern elites with a globalist mindset no longer have much, to all appearances anyway, that they would believe worth defending unto death. Which is why so many of the leaders were astonished when President Zelensky turned down their offer of escape from danger. Because he was giving them a vision of a mindset that they hadn't seen before, or that they believed lost to history. 
Maybe in our societies it has been. Thanks to the internet, we've become disconnected, focused on communities of interest, widely dispersed, rather than actual physical communities. What happens online, who says what on Twitter, has become equally important as what happens in the real world with real world consequences to, say, our immediate neighbour. It's an indulgence you can only allow yourself once you've slain all the tigers, conquered all the enemies, and then found yourself asking, what do I do now? What was the point of it all? And even if we don't fall for the populists or the conspiracy tricksters who very much depend on your sense of alienation to draw you in, you can still end up rendered incapable of acting as a society of common interest when you actually really need to. Because yes, we did, and to some extent still do, face a pandemic. And we indulged ourselves with a polarised response where different groups had their favoured medical treatments and their favoured non-medical policies, and it fell along group identity lines, political lines mostly. Which is a huge tell for when people aren't really following science or following evidence because the virus doesn't care about your politics. Did your political group have favoured medications distinct to its members before the pandemic? Nah, probably not. And the same, of course, with how we respond to climate change. Yes, one side wants to hype it into a crisis because they're convinced that if it's not so hyped, then people will put off taking necessary action and let's face it, because they favour major lifestyle changes that could only be justified by a heightened sense of crisis. And then the other side sees the hype and concludes there must be no foundation to any of it. Again, clearly those visible manifestations of the issue are not focused on the evidence. The global climate, again, does not care about your politics. Such politics can shape the laws of the land, Good luck trying to use it to repeal the laws of physics. Now, in both situations, we have a community faced with a real problem to which a collective response would be of value. But we've lost the common bounds of community that would enable us to do such a thing. So we should realise the divisions are not about the details of the issues themselves. David Goodhart wrote about the key division in the UK over Brexit had become that between what he labelled as somewheres and anywheres. The somewheres were the people who were of a place. They were less highly educated, more focused around skilled crafts, and they felt abandoned in the modern sense of priorities. And then the anywheres. They were the people who went to university, decided that they could literally live anywhere in the world, and they were focused on a life of individual achievement rather than how they were part of a system. Now, these are broad generalisations, but they did describe something that was observably real in where we'd gotten to and the nature of the discourse we were having. They explained perspectives that can lead to the arrogant overreach of technocrats and the instinctive retreat from evidence behind a shield of tradition on the other side. The technocrats embraced the challenge of global challenges that we face, but they have very little respect for the system that makes society work. They consider it an obstacle, they consider it and the values that underpin it as outdated, old-fashioned, racist. And that's why they utterly fail to be able to persuade people to act together. And especially in recent years, when they started to look at psychological techniques to nudge people to do what they should do, which is what we saw happening in the pandemic. And they didn't even notice. Now, be aware, these are generalisations, which I'm not a fan of, but they're very useful in a specific context. Don't get carried away. But they didn't even notice that this moves us from persuasion to manipulation. If you want to know why so many people were upset at Boris Johnson's parties, which seems such a trivial thing, it comes down to the sense of having had something done to you rather than the people being freely recruited to join in a common cause. That then has been the red meat for those who thrive on generalisations, who build upon that feeling of being lost, to identify that the problem is those others. Once you have a sense of that, it becomes all too easy to believe that this is a formal, organised assault on what you hold dear, 
rather than something more organic, people just following the incentives in front of them. And that's what leads into all of those conspiracy theories and so on. Anyway, where does that leave us? You and me. How do we adapt and respond to the extraordinary times we live in? This fascinating moment in history. The details depend on where you're starting from, of course. Some of the themes, though, that I think benefit us all. First, let's accept that we live in newly historic times. It is in our interest to make ourselves individually stronger and more resilient. You have to learn what strong and resilient means. There's wrong ways to go about it. But start by taking an interest in your strengths and your weaknesses. What would it mean in your situation to be stronger? How would you invest in that? Second, remember, we're not on that straight line journey. Whatever we do is part of a system. Like gardeners, we make progress by doing what needs to be done at the right time according to the system, investing in the health that underpins that system and makes everything happen. If you identify yourself with the global mindset, you're focused on solving some of those big problems because some of them really do need tackling. Remember, they are not one variable problems. Solving climate change isn't just about reducing CO2 in the atmosphere. It's about finding ways to enable human society to continue to flourish while reducing CO2 in the atmosphere. And it would be good if you could understand that if you lose the consent of those communities, sooner or later, you will lose permission to do anything at all. So understanding, empathising with people is as much a part of a job as knowing what the physics of the atmosphere might be. Those people usually object to that argument and say, but, but, but there isn't time. Well, first of all, there's usually more time than you think. But in any case, the urge to push for your way without regard to people, without taking people with you, is guaranteed to fail. Now, presumably guaranteed failure doesn't do much for your sense of urgency either. Now, if you don't identify with that mindset, you're not focused on global problems that need solving, you just spend all your time lost and worried that the world is doing life to you and you're not living it for yourself, then I would say you need to find your purpose and you need to find the subsystem that will support it. By subsystem, of course, what I really mean is the community of people. A part of strength and resiliency comes from action. Inaction will feed all of your fears. And we've been trained too much to be passive consumers of entertainment and information. But look, there's no simple glib formula for all of this. If someone tells you there is, then they're probably trying to sell you something. So that's what I think. What do you think? Does any of this analysis ring true for you? Does it go wide of a mark for your experience? And if so, what is your perspective? Let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know what you thought of this experiment. I'm not going to change the main thrust and the meat of the content on this channel, but should I occasionally do more of these sorts of discussion videos? Should I consign it to the digital waste bin as a misguided experiment? And if not, what would you want me to talk about? What would you like to discuss next? Let me know all of that in the comments below. Thanks for making it this far. See you on Friday for the News Roundup. Looks like we might have some meaty news to talk about this week. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself.